Hello, and welcome to, to today's webinar on our new approach to continuing competence. My name is Richard Williams. I'm a policy associate here at the SRA. And my name is Maxine Moore. I'm a policy manager in the regulation and education team at the SRA. Before we get into the content of the webinar, we just wanted to kind of point you to a, um, to a couple of points. Firstly, if there, you have any technical issues with, with, this, with this webinar, there is a button that you can click where we have people available to provide some technical support to you. Uh, secondly, please feel free to submit questions to us um, using the questions button throughout this webinar and at the end of the slides we'll sort of collate the key themes and we'll answer some of those questions in a Q&A session at the end. So in terms of the outcomes of the webinar, um, what we really want to do is provide a bit more clarity around our new approach to continuing competence. Uh, we want to provide some more, more information about what the changes involve, how those changes affect you, we want to give you a great understanding of our competence statement and an overview of our toolkit and some further information on how we will support you in moving towards this new approach. Before we start, I thought it would be quite useful to sort of set this new approach um, in, in the context of our regulation, our approach to regulation. As a regulator, our purpose is to protect the consumers of legal services and to support the operation of the rule of law and the proper administration of justice. So therefore, ensuring that solicitors remain competent post-qualification is central to us achieving these regulatory objectives. A number of people it might be worth this sort of quickly providing a background to, to the drivers behind the change to uh, our current approach of 16 hours. Um, there are a number of reasons why we thought it was necessary. Um, firstly, the current system is based on an, an arbitrary number of hours. And though that approach, that inputs approach, is no guarantee of, of competence. There is nothing to say that a solicitor undertaking 15 hours is wholly incompetent. And there's nothing to say that a solicitor undertaking more than 16 hours is, 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 is greatly competent. That approach, that inputs approach, was driving the wrong sort of learning and development behaviour. People were focusing their learning and development on the accumulation of 16 hours and compliance with our regulatory requirement, rather than thinking about what learning and development they needed to do in order to be a competent solicitor who provides a proper standard of service. The third driver is really around our approach to regulation. We're moving away from blanket regulation to targeted and proportionate regulation. The requirement on all solicitors to undertake 16 hours is a blanket regulation. We know from our stakeholder engagement that um, some of the roles that solicitors perform with, with, within organisations don't necessarily require 16 hours of learning and development. And this places, in some cases, an unnecessary regulatory burden on, on firms. There are lots of ways in which people can undertake learning and development, and this is kind of rapidly changing and constantly evolving. We wanted an approach that reflected people's learning and development styles. So that was another reason why we considered change necessary. So what does our new approach involve? We'll talk about some of these characteristics a little bit more later in the webinar when we look at our toolkit. But in terms of a, a, an overview, um, our new approach involves no requirement to undertake 16 hours of CPD. It requires reflecting on your practice by reference to our competence statement. And in doing that, you will identify learning development needs. Under our new approach, we'd like you to record what those learning development needs are and undertake activity to address them. The final stage of, of that process is really to think about how and what the impact was of that learning and, and development and record that. And finally, you'll be required under our new approach to make an annual declaration. Why do you need to do this? A key element of our code of conduct is principle five, which outlines that all solicitors need to deliver a proper standard of service. So the regulatory hook around our new approach is, is very much linked to that provision of a proper standard of service. 
for all solicitors, meeting the competencies set out in the competence statement forms an integral part of the requirement to provide a proper standard of service. We'll talk a little bit more about the competence statement later in this webinar. So there are some other consequential changes to our existing approach uh, as we, as we move, move forward. So from the 1st of November last year, we removed the requirement to undertake accredited training. And as a result, we stopped authorising external and internal providers. From the 1st of April 2015, no, there is no requirement placed on solicitors to undertake management course stage one. And really the driver behind these changes is, is that they remove a prescription from our current CPD regulations and afford individual solicitors freedom and flexibility in order them to determine what learning and development they consider is necessary to deliver a proper standard of service. As well, we will no longer award hours for any events that the SRA undertakes. So now we just want to talk you briefly through the benefits of the new approach. We really hope that the benefits are clear, but what's key is that the new approach will give you the freedom and the flexibility to decide for yourself what training and development you need. Only you know what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, um, and what your development areas are. We as the regulator don't know that, and in fact, it's not our role to know that. We accept that you're all professionals, and an essential part of being a professional is being able to reflect on your own competence, on your own performance, on your strengths and weaknesses, and taking the appropriate steps to address those weaknesses. So a lot of solicitors have said to us, um, I like doing, undertaking 16 hours um, CPD every year. I think that works for me. If you think that 16 hours CPD every year is what you need, then that's absolutely fine. If you think you need to go on an external training course in order to address your training needs, then that too is fine. But if you think, actually, I get all the development that I need, for example, from a monthly meeting that you hold with your colleagues, where you talk about cases that you have recently worked on, then again, that's fine. It's entirely up to you. It's for you to decide how you address your learning and development needs. We've also developed a competence statement um, which supports our new approach and I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But the good thing about the competence statement is that for the first time it very clearly articulates what it means to be a competent solicitor. One of the other benefits of the new approach is that um, we hope that it will reduce the regulatory burden for some firms. In some cases um, the new approach might even result in cost savings for firms because at the moment we do know that some firms simply send their solicitors on 16 hours external training without really thinking about whether that's what their solicitors actually need. This can of course be very expensive, particularly if it's unnecessary. In some cases it will be the right thing to do. Some solicitors will need to go on external training and they will still need 16 hours or somewhere in the region of 16 hours. Um, some, however, some solicitors in other cases might be better addressing their um, learning and development needs in a different way. So, for example, they might decide that they have a, a colleague or a more senior colleague who might be able to offer them some coaching. And this might be a more cost effective way for them to address their training needs. Clearly what's needed will depend on the individual, it will depend on their individual circumstances, it will depend on their job at the point in their career that they are. We've also removed the requirement for people to go on accredited training um, and what this means is that firms and external providers can be more innovative in their design and their delivery of training. They can design and deliver training which is more tailored specifically to the needs of the individuals of their employers and providers can tailor their training specifically to their target market and by doing this they can recognize that individuals learn in different ways um, and that competence in fact develops in many different ways depending on the individual depending on their job role or on the point at which they are in their career so i just want to go back to talk about the competence statement which i previously mentioned 
Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about it because it really lies at the heart of our reforms and in particular it is critical to our new approach to continuing competence. What the competence statement sets out is what a competent solicitor needs to do in order to practice effectively. We will be using it both to set the standard for the point of qualification as a solicitor, but we also intend it to be used as a tool to help solicitors identify their learning and development needs. The competence statement itself is an activity-based statement. What we mean by that is it sets out exactly what a solicitor needs to be able to do in order to demonstrate that they are competent. Hopefully there's nothing in it that you won't recognise. It's divided into four domains, all of which will be familiar to you um, as a solicitor and all of which are critical to the role of a solicitor. The four domains are ethics, professionalism and judgment, technical legal practice, managing yourself and your work and working with people. The good thing about the competence statement is that it's generic. So it recognises that requirements and expectations change depending on job role and depending on the context. It also recognises that competence develops and that an individual may work competently at many different levels and at many different stages of their career. So I'd urge you to have a look at it. Um, there's nothing in there that should be a surprise to you. Hopefully you should recognise it as what you do in your job every day. I'd also like to reassure you that the competence statement has been developed through consultation, very close consultation and extensive consultation with both the profession and with consumers. It's been robustly tested. We have involved over 2,000 solicitors in testing the competence statement and the feedback from our testing has been really positive um, and people say that it does accurately reflect what solicitors today need to do in order to be competent. So how would you use the competence statement? An important point that you need to note is that um, in order to demonstrate the importance of the competence statement, we are going to be adding a note to principle five in the handbook. Principle five in the handbook says that you have to deliver a proper standard of service. We're going to add a note to that principle to say that um, an integral part of providing a proper standard of service is that you ensure you meet the competences in the competence statement. So the competence statement does have a regulatory value and we would expect all solicitors to be aware of it and to use it to help them determine their training and development needs. Of course, the requirement to comply with Principle 5, as, as I'm sure you all know, is not new. You're currently obliged to provide a proper standard of service and to do this, you need to be competent. What is new is that now we have defined what we mean by competence through the competence statement. So as I said before, the competence statement is generic. So what you need to do is you need to take a look at it and you need to decide how it translates into the, into the job that you do. And then you need to ask yourself, are there any areas in the competence statement where, where you're weaker than others? And if there are, these might be the areas where you need to undertake some training or development. We also hope that the competence statement could be a useful tool for employers and would help them to structure their learning and development for solicitors. We do know that many firms already have very well established performance management systems. We also know that many firms have very well established competence statements. Where this is the case, we would hope that the competence statement can simply be integrated into existing systems. We wouldn't expect it to add any additional burden in those firms where systems already are well established. Hopefully it will simply enhance those systems that already exist. But in those firms where those sorts of systems do not already exist, we would hope that the competence statement could be a starting point for developing those systems. So hopefully we've given you a, a good overview of the new approach and its benefits. In the rest of the webinar, we'll be talking about what this actually means, how it might work in practice, and we'll also talk you through some of the tools that we have available to you. Um, but before that, I'll just briefly run through this timetable for the new approach. 
So you've already from the 1st of November 2014, we have removed the requirement to undertake accredited training. So you no longer have to do four hours of your CPD through accredited training courses. From the 1st of April 2015, solicitors can choose to adopt the new approach if they wish to. If you do wish to adopt the new approach, you just go ahead and do so, you don't need to tell us. If you don't wish to adopt the new approach, then that too is fine. And you have until the 1st of November 2016, when all regulated individuals and entities will be required to comply with a new approach. So what this means for you is, at the moment, you still have a choice. Uh, up until the 1st of November, you can choose whether you follow the existing CPD requirements or whether you want to adopt the new approach. So we do know that many solicitors will still want to continue with the existing approach until the new approach become mandatory. And of course, this is fine. We do understand that some solicitors want to see how the new approach is bedded in, and some firms also want time to um, develop new systems to help support the, the new approach where systems don't already exist. So if you want to continue with the current approach for the time being, that's fine. You must continue to undertake 16 hours of CPD. You'll also be required to make a declaration that the current CPD requirements have been met for the 2014-15 year and for the 2015-16 year. And as I've already said, you don't, although you do have to do 16 hours, you don't have to undertake accredited training. Um, and also as a slight aside, but for anybody who has got high rights of audience, if you decide to continue with the current approach, you do still need to meet the CPD requirements in the higher rights of audience regulations, which are that you have to do five years of CPD in the first five years following award of the qualification. And you have to continue to do that up until the 1st of November 2016. For those solicitors and their employees who wish to move to the new approach, you can do so from the 1st of April 2015. As Maxine has pointed out, you don't need to tell us um, that you're moving to the new approach. However, in moving to the new approach, it will require you to reflect on the quality of your practice, identify and address your learning and development needs. You will also need to think very much about how you record this information, particularly in terms of the learning and development needs you're going to undertake, but also the evaluation of that activity and how it's impacted on, on your role. You will also need to continue to meet the regulatory responsibility to provide a proper standard of service. And in doing the ref in reflecting on your practice, identifying and addressing in reference to our competence statement is one way in which you can, you can achieve that proper standard of service. We're asked by many solicitors and their employers whether or not um, they will need to pro rata any of the 16 hours before adopting the new, new approach. Our position on this is that we don't think it's necessary to do that. If you want to move to a new approach mid-CPD year, then there is no requirement on our behalf to, to pro rata any of the 16 hours up until the point at which you opt in. Again, there's no requirement to undertake accredited training from the 1st of November 2014. And under our new approach, you must be able to demonstrate that learning and de development has been considered and addressed. We won't be prescriptive about the type of evidence we would expect you to provide. That is very much up for you as an individual or you as, as an employer to determine the systems and processes that enabled you to identify, to record and evaluate the activity that you have undertaken. In terms of the annual declaration, we will be releasing further information on this in advance of the new CPD year starting on the 1st of November 2015. We recognise that, that for many of you, you will want to understand, to know the wording and to understand how you will make the annual declaration before you consider when you choose to adopt our new approach. We appreciate this. However, we think that planning and development in terms of moving towards our new approach can still continue because any declaration 
will be linked to the requirement to provide a proper standard of service and the requirement to reflect on your practice with reference to the competence statement and to address any identified learning and development needs. So those kind of building blocks of the declaration will still be there so to enable you to kind of consider the approach and how you might implement this within existing systems or within developing new systems regarding learning and development. You're not required to notify us of the approach you, you, you decide to take and you can adopt the new approach any time after the 1st of April 2015. We expect solicitors will, will want to discuss this new approach with their employees and employers will want to discuss the approach with their solicitors. We think it's a, a joint decision. We want, we want to and we expect that there will be discussion around how individuals and employees can continue to deliver a proper standard of service, what it will mean to move to the new approach, what types of changes internally need to happen, what type of internal communication needs to happen. So all of these things will, will, will be part of a, a melting pot in terms of deciding when to move to the new approach. We recognise that what we've talked about today um, will require a significant cultural change for some parts of the profession. In order to support the profession, we have developed a toolkit. The toolkit provides suggestions on how to reflect on your identify, uh, how to reflect and identify your learning development needs, how to plan them, how to address them, and how to record and evaluate them. They are just simply suggestions. What, we're, what we have contained in our toolkit is not mandatory. It's up to you how you use the information. It won't tell you how much or the type of activity you need to do either. That is very much a decision for you to take based on what you believe your learning and development needs are. So for the next part of the webinar, we'd want I want to talk about the content of the toolkit, how you can use it, and some of the key messages that are contained within, within it that underpin our new approach to continuing competence. The toolkit has been developed with input from parts of the profession. We've engaged with a number of stakeholders, for example, Sole Practitioners Group, and we have taken advice from specialist learning and development advisors within the profession. The landing page, as you see now, contains a number of boxes. These boxes relate to the specific stages of our toolkit. We have taken this approach because we want to make the toolkit itself as accessible as possible and hope that you can look at each box depending on what you need to know and when you need to know it. We know from our research that some firms and some solicitors already have quite comprehensive approaches to learning and development in place. And as a result, they may only want to quickly check this particular toolkit. For others, though, um, the move towards our new approach will present greater challenges and the entirety of this toolkit might well be relevant to them. The first box contains useful information. Much of it we've discussed in this webinar today. However, it will describe to you what you can do to meet our regulatory requirements under this new approach. And it will also tell you some key messages that you will need to remember about our, our approach. At the bottom of this section, there is a short video which explains to you how you can implement our new approach to The first stage in, in our new approach is really reflecting on your practice to identify your learning and development needs. In this section, we can des describe what do we mean by reflection. And for the purposes of our new approach, this means creating opportunities to step back from your practice, to consider how you think you are performing, what you think you've learned from any particular experience and what you might do differently. We also talk about when you might want to reflect on your practice. For example, is it at a transactional level when you're reflecting on a, a current job or a current piece of work you're doing or, are, or reflecting on a more general level when considering uh, your, your work more holistically? You may also want to consider a helpful prompts to help you reflect. 
For example, what are my strengths and weaknesses? What could I have done better? And in relation to the knowledge, skills, and behaviours, how would how would I describe where I am now, where I compared to where I need to be? So there's some helpful prompts to help you think through the, the process of reflection and, and identify your learning and development leads. We understand that reflection will not sit in isolation of your, your, how you practice and your performance management systems if you work within an organisation that have them. We offer opportunities and practical approaches to identifying your learning and development needs. These really are perhaps drivers or triggers which may drive you to reflect on the quality of your practice. For example, they include appraisal or performance development reviews, a competence statement which we've already discussed, monitoring changes in practice and law and regulation, and reviewing client feedback, for example. All of these may require you to reflect on the quality of your practice. Again, at the end of the se section, there is a short video which enables you to identify and address your learning and development needs. At the top of each section of the toolkit, we take the key points that you need to remember about this, the particular section. So for, the, for this section, how to reflect to, to identify your learning and development needs, you need to think about your practice and identify your learning and development needs and you will need to record your, your identified learning and development needs. A key message is also that it is important to devote an appropriate time for reflection. Once you've identified your learning and development needs, you will need to consider how to plan them. In this section, we provide some helpful advice on how you can do this. These, this, this information, this section is, is, is really based uh, on suggestions and good practice from ac across the profession. It is not meant to be prescriptive or mandatory. To help you plan your identified learning and development needs and how you want to address them, you may want to think about what you need to do, why you need to do it, when you need to do it, and how you will do it. And also, it might be helpful for to, to think about how you're going to prioritise your learning and development needs. We do require, under our new approach, you to record your thinking. We provide an example document to help you do this, and we'll come on and show you that a little bit later. At the bottom of this section, we, pro we provide an example of what um, an input in, in, into any recording mechanism that you may have might well look like. We're not suggesting that, that firms or solicitors need to, um, to, to build new systems or reconfigure existing systems if you already have them in terms of how you record. What we would like you to do is simply record the activity you're, you're likely to undertake. In terms of planning, we'll need to consider how you address your identified learning and development needs. Under our new approach, there is greater freedom and flexibility for you as an individual solicitor to address your identified learning and development needs. This means you can undertake a range of training, um, whether that training is more formal training or whether it is um, le less formal, for example, um, following uh, Twitter feeds or contributing to online debates. This particular section sets out a, a range of approaches that you may wish to take. Again, it is not prescriptive, nor it is exhaustive. In terms of the activity in, in this section, it is important to note that under our new approach, any approach is valid as long as you can demonstrate how it contributes to you ensuring your ongoing competence. Through our stakeholder engagement, concern has been raised by a number of solicitors that um, the, the requirement, removing the requirement to remove 16 hours means they may not be able to access training. The important part of this particular section is that there are lots of cost-effective ways in which you can address your 
learning and development needs. For example, networking, observing, speaking with colleagues, undertaking file reviews, speaking with peers, all will provide you with a mechanism to address your learning and development needs. Again, at the bottom of this section, there is a video from practitioners within the profession which, which explains how they go about addressing their learning development needs. And again, at the top of the section, we have the key bullet points there, um, which are for, the, for, for how you should address your learning development needs. Make sure that it's valid. You can tailor your learning and development to suit your learning and your learning style under our new approach. And it is important to turn your learning into doing something differently in your job. Once you've undertaken your learning development activity, you will need to ensure that you record and evaluate what you have done. In this particular section of the toolkit, we provide information on what we mean by a development record, which is one mechanism for capturing the information that we require. It's not the only approach. You may have existing approaches that already uh, address what we require. But in terms of suggestions, you may find it helpful to capture what you did, how the activity was related to ensuring your competence, what you learnt and when the activity was completed. It is really important that you evaluate your learning and development activity under our new approach. You have a regulatory obligation to provide a proper standard of service. Undertaking learning and development activity itself isn't, doesn't necessarily guarantee that. In undertaking your learning and development activity, you may well identify further learning and development needs. In addition, the learning and development activity you've undertaken may well not address the original need that you wanted it to. So you need to go through that evaluation process to see if what you have done has worked or whether there's more that you need to do. We also have a range of wider resources for you, which will support the adoption and implementation of our new approach. You can access these um, using the, the navigation menu down the left hand side. Here you can see a wider range of resources. We will have further information on the annual decoration. Once, once further information is available, this is where it will be. We also recognise that solicitors and their employers are exceptionally busy people. We have produced a one-side short summary guide of our toolkit. This really condenses the key points that you need to take into account when adopting our new approach. They are colour coded so they relate to each particular stage. They really just summarise the key points that you need to take into account when adopting and implementing our new approach and in doing so it will help you meet your regulatory obligations. We also have wider case studies than the videos that I showed you in the each section of, of the toolkit. Here within the case study section, we identify a range of approaches that various segments of the profession adopt to ensure that they provide a proper standard of service. They cover, they cover a range of scenarios, for example, a sole practitioner, small firm and large firm um, and a traditional law firm. They provide information on how these particular types of organisations or individual have ensured they provide a proper standard of service. We'll keep adding to these as we move forward to implementation. In particular, if you think you've got a, a particularly interesting approach or innovative approach, please feel free to contact us in order to, to add this to our growing body of evidence. I mentioned templates as part of the how to plan and how to record and evaluate section. 
We have provided in the template section an example of a development plan and an example of a development record. Again, these are not prescriptive. They are simply examples that you may wish to use in order to address your identified learning and development needs. You can also access some research in the resources section that we've undertaken to look at the education training arrangements in regulated entities. This research provides examples on what organisations do and um, in terms of meeting the current existing requirements. We've provided so far in this webinar an overview of our new approach and an overview of our toolkit and an overview of our competence statement. So what happens next? Well, what we suggest you may want to do is consider the contents of the toolkit, consider the competence statement, and in particular think about how you can apply the competence statement to your existing learning and development approaches or performance management systems. This will naturally facilitate an internal discussion. The key thing that you need to consider when taking forward our new approach and when and how you implement it is how will you ensure that you remain competent? You can adopt the new approach on the 1st of April 2015 and as we've already explained, the new approach applies to all solicitors from the 1st of November 2016. We recognise the new approach requires a cultural change and as a result we're going to provide a range of resources to support you in moving towards this new approach. We've already done some research and we identified that in our toolkit. On our website there is a position statement which was issued in October. That document provides some helpful clarity around what we expect from you under our new approach. We have a dedicated area of our website devoted to the Training for Tomorrow programme of which our new approach sits. There are lots of resources on there. There are previous webinars and a range of Q&A documents which you will find helpful in giving you a backstory or context or answering specific questions you may well have. We've also committed to a programme of stakeholder engagement right through to November 2016. We're particularly keen to get out to all parts of the country and sit down with firms and individuals to provide an overview of our new approach, but also help them with any particular questions you may well have around implementation. Keep a lookout for these. The best place to look for them is obviously in our wider SRA press and eShots, but also you can find these on the Training for Tomorrow Connect section of our website. We'll also provide regular communications to you on what you need to know and when you need to, to know it. On the screen you'll see there our Twitter account and also our email address. This will enable you to contact us in, through both those mechanisms with questions or queries you may well have. At the bottom there, there is the web address for the Training for Tomorrow page, which I mentioned earlier and which contains a whole host of resources. So, we've reached the end of the webinar. We're going to take a very short break now while we collate some of the questions that you've been submitting to us during it. Okay, well, we hope you've found that information in the webinar um, very useful um, in terms of the overview of the competence statement as well as the toolkit. We've had a chance now to look at some of your questions and we'll run through as many as we can in the 20 minutes remaining. If we don't get a chance to address your specific question, we'll take those away with us and do our best to get back to you um, through including them on our Q&As on, on the website. Um, we've had a number of questions from, from in-house solicitors, um, particularly around the application of the new approach and also concerns around accessing, accessing learning and development opportunities. Um, the new approach, if chosen, does apply to in-house solicitors. Um, so you will still need to continue to meet your regulatory obligation to meet Principle 5 by undertaking regular um, learning and development and regularly reflecting on your practice to ensure your skills are up to date. 
a number of questions are sort of focused on the fact that the removal of the 16 hours um, may mean that um, in-house solicitors cannot access training opportunities. The webinar is very clear um, in the sense that you have a regulatory obligation to provide a proper standard of service, so you can point your employer at that. We also appreciate that cost in these circumstances might well be an issue. Hopefully, the toolkit has provided a, a good overview of the range of cost-effective ways that you can address identified learning and development needs. Some of the videos on the toolkit also are from um, in-house in solicitors, so have a look at those uh, and you'll be able to pull out some hopefully useful information. We'll also be producing over the next couple of weeks a specific one-page document for in-house solicitors, which they may want to use in order to um, bring their employers up to date on the particular changes. We've also had a number of questions coming around management course stage one. From today, uh, there is no requirement for any solicitor to undertake management course stage one. That um, regulatory requirement has been removed from our handbook, so if it applies to you or you still need to um, undertake management course one from the point where you've qualified, you do not need to do so now. For those Individuals that may be taking up management positions, um, some of the content of the man some, some of the content of the management course stage one is covered by other regulations within our framework. A number of questions have also come in from sole practitioners and in terms of how they're expected to implement the new approach. Hopefully what the toolkit has demonstrated is that some of the principles that we're talking around in terms of reflecting, planning, addressing, recording and evaluating um, are simple, are accessible and can be implemented quite, quite easily. Again, the toolkit contains case studies in terms of uh, perspectives from some sole practitioners on how they go about reflecting, identifying, addressing and recording and evaluating. There's also a case study in the case study section uh, of the, the toolkit where it points to uh, a practice from across the profession. We've had a couple of questions in terms of what is the impact of our new approach on those practicing overseas. Well, in terms of this particular group, um, again, there is this choice around whether they continue to um, meet our CP, existing CPD requirements or move to the new approach. If they choose to meet the existing requirements, then it is as it is now, without the requirement to undertake accredited training. However, if these group of solicitors or, or the firm in which they're employed by moves to the new approach, then we will expect that solicitors will reflect on the quality of their practice, identify, address learning development needs, and undertake any learning and development to address those and reflect on, on that particular activity. The reason for this is, is, is quite simple. Um, if you're under our new approach, you're bound by principle five to deliver a, a, a proper standard of service. And just because you practice overseas doesn't exclude you from this. Um, and also, we've removed the requirement to undertake accredited training, which means you can access more uh, accessible and cost-effective training. We've had a number of questions um, broadly on the competence statement and how it applies, how it can be used with, a, with, the, with this new approach. We've had some questions around what, ha what does the solicitor need to do or what can they do if they need to undertake more learning and development. As we've discussed today, solicitors have a regulatory obligation to deliver a proper standard of service um, as per Principle 5. If a solicitor has reflected on the quality of their practice and identified any gaps in their knowledge or skills, then they will need to undertake learning and development to address these gaps. What this means in practice is that technically they should not work in an area where they're not competent to do so until those learning and development needs have been met or unless a competent solicitor is able to supervise their work before it goes out. Um, in terms of 
whether the competent statement acts as a barrier for people taking on new roles or promotions within a firm. Um, we don't think it acts as a barrier. The competent statement is not designed to restrict the career progression of a solicitor, nor is it designed to hinder a firm's business objectives. What it does do is, is clearly articulate what is required to practice safely and effectively. So if going for a new role, an individual has the necessary skills and knowledge to to complete that role against the competence statement and, and do it safely and effectively, then that's absolutely okay. However, if there are gaps in knowledge and skills, they will have to be addressed before that role is undertaken. Uh, quite a number of questions on, on, on how the competence statement applies um, in, in terms of whether or not individuals have to know everything, the entire content of the competence, competence statement or not. The competence statement is generic. It applies to your role, to your context, to your experience. We wouldn't expect you to know absolutely everything in the competence statement if it is not relevant to what you do. However, we wouldn't expect you to be competent at the skills and knowledge for, uh, for what is relevant to your role. We've had quite a few questions around monitoring and how we as an organisation and we as a regulator will ensure that solicitors continue to undertake learning and development as part of our new approach. As we've discussed today, solicitors have a regulatory and professional responsibility to undertake learning and development so as to provide a proper standard of service. And we take this obligation very seriously. That's why we'll have an annual declaration in place um, as part of this new approach. However, our primary interest as a regulator is whether a solicitor is competent rather than checking whether a declaration or whether a particular learning activity has been undertaken. We'll be monitoring competence in a holistic way. We'll be looking at thematic reviews across the sector, we'll review complaints, we'll review data we receive as an organisation around the quality of an individual or a firm's work. We'll also be using our supervision function as part of this part of this approach. Where we find evidence of a of a competence issue or a competence risk, then we will want to take steps to ensure that an individual, a firm, has in place what we've outlined in terms of our requirements today. A failure to do so is likely to be an aggravating factor in any disciplinary proceedings. In terms of accredited training, we've had a number of questions. Um, the, re the requirement to undertake accredited training was removed on the 1st of November, so firms um, or, or courses should not be accredited anymore. Um, they can still obviously offer the hours, however, it, it will not be SRA accredited training. In terms of particular questions around whether or not you actually need to undertake learning and development or not. Um, under our new approach, it may mean that some individual solicitors don't have to undertake learning and development. When they're looking at our competent statement, they may well feel that they are competent to meet what they need to do in order to perform their role effectively. And that's absolutely okay. What we would expect people to those individuals to be able to do is to demonstrate that they have gone through a particular process to come to that conclusion that they do not have any learning and development needs. It's worth bearing in mind though that the nature and the legal the nature of the legal profession and the pace of the legal profession is such that there is always changes and quite rapid changes. So we would expect some form of learning of and development to be appropriate for all solicitors at some point. We've got a number of questions around what happens if I'm away for practice, if I go on maternity leave, or if I uh, take an extended period away from the profession. We don't expect you to undertake learning and development whilst you're on leave or away from the profession. However, on re-entry back into practice, we would expect you to ensure that you have the necessary knowledge and skills 
to ensure that you can continue to provide a proper standard of service. And in some cases, it might mean that you will need to brush up on your skills and knowledge. Whilst, you, whilst we have you here as a captive audience, we'd like to take the opportunity to ask you a question. We're particularly interested to know when you plan to opt in under this new approach. So we, we would like to ask you a quick question now, a quick poll question. Um, you should be able to see that on your screens um, any second now. Uh, we'd like you to look at uh, the answers and pick, a, pick, pick one which applies to you. We'll give you about 30 seconds to do that, um, and then we'll come back and have a quick discussion about the results. Okay, if we can have a look at the results now to see what you've, you've answered, that would be fantastic. Okay, well, look, looking at those results, most of the people are still undecided, um, just over 40%, and that's obviously um, completely natural given today is sort of the first day from opt-in, and we've released our toolkit and the competence statement, and we will expect the majority of individuals and, fir and firms will want to digest some of the information that we've provided. Just over a quarter of you have voted, actually, that you tend to go early from today in terms of adopting the, the new approach. If you are, we'd be very interested to hear from you about um, in terms of um, what you plan to do, how you plan to address your learning development needs, etc. as this will help us populate the case study with, with good case examples. Um, the third group of people is really around waiting to the beginning of the new CPD year, which commences on the 1st of November 20, 2015. And then the remaining number of people, just over 10%, will wait till the 1st of, 1st of November 2016. And that, that's, that's really interesting and very helpful from our perspective. Um, a number of you have asked around whether or not we'll be doing an evaluation and review of our new approach. We have committed to this, um, and we'll be doing a high-level review um, this time next year just to get a sense check of, of where things are going, whether or not there are any issues, and to kind of refresh our content on the toolkit. There will be a more formal evaluation in 2017, which is one full year after the implementation of, of the scheme from the 1st of November 2016. A number of you have asked about case studies. Uh, we'll be adding to this case studies as we move closer to the 1st of November 2016, so do keep, keep an eye out on those as we will be regularly updating them. We have also a number of questions around the notes of Principle 5. Um, that, is, that, that is part of our new approach, and what that note will, will, will say in, in our handbook is that um, an integral part of satisfying uh, and, and delivering a proper standard of services is, is meeting the competencies outlined in the competence statement. Um, so you can have a look at that um, in our handbook. Um, people are asking when we will be issuing the further information on the declaration. Um, that will be, um, as we described in the webinar, um, in advance of the start of the new CPD uh, on the 1st of November. 2015. A number of questions around is it a solicitor's own responsibility to maintain records or the firm's responsibility? Um, that will very much be down to discussion between the firm and individual as to how they wish to implement our new approach. We know from our research that many firms already have existing systems and processes that capture the learning and development um, requirements, how those learning requirements have been addressed from individual solicitors, solicitors that they employ. Those systems are very likely still to be um, acceptable under our new approach. Um, for individual solicitors or sole practitioners, we've provided a number of case 
examples of what perhaps the development plan and development record what may well look like. I think a key approach is we're not really trying to, to increase the regulatory burden on individual solicitors and firms. All we will really be asking to do under a new approach, if required, is for you to be able to evidence and demonstrate that you have met the requirements of our new approach. So you've identified, reflected, and addressed your learning and development needs. A number of you are asking around where the competence statement is on our in our website and the toolkit. Um, you, if you go to the main SRA webpage and look in the solicitor section, towards the right hand side, top right hand side, there will be a, a link that takes you to the competence statement and to the toolkit. A number of people are asking uh, about the impact of removing accredited training on the provision of, of, of training and the training market. Um, that's really not a, a regulatory issue for us. Um, we've taken away the requirements of the take accredited training in order to permit solicitors and firms to um, enable them to have the freedom and flexibility to adopt our new approach. Um, we hope that the market will, will be able to uh, demonstrate what is good quality training um, and what perhaps isn't training that addresses your needs. Under our new approach, some of that training still, still will be relevant. Some may not be because there may be well uh, more effective ways in which you can address your learning and development needs. We're rapidly running out of time now. Um, we'd just like you to, to thank you um, for, for viewing and listening to this webinar. We hope you found it useful. Um, before you go, um, you'll see a link to an exit survey. We'd really like to hear your views on how well this webinar went, but also on what other issues across um, our whole regulatory framework you would be interested in hearing and listening to. If you have any questions on our new approach in terms of implementation, how you can do it, what does it mean, um, you can contact us. Uh, we've provided the contact details on previous slides. Uh, you can tweet us and we'll do our very best to get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Do keep an eye on the toolkit. Um, we will be refreshing it and updating it with new content as, as we go along, adding new videos, etc. So thanks for joining us. Um, and we hope you find it useful.